All right, in an effort to respect your time, we're gonna go ahead and get started. As others enter, please be patient with me as I admit them to our room. My name is Ann Carmichael, and I'm a college financial aid consultant. I'm presenting tonight on behalf of Leela. Leela has been in the um, student financial aid business for over 25 years, and we try to keep students and parents up to date on the process. There are a couple of changes this year for those of you who have already completed FAFSAs, either for yourself or for um, older children. And we're going to go over a couple of basics and then some more uh, fine details. So in addition to institutional, private, um, student aid, the FAFSA is also your application for all federal student aid. That's gonna include the federal free money, borrowed money, and earned money. And even if you have a feeling that you might not be eligible for federal student aid, or you may not need the borrowed money, it's always best to go ahead and get the free application for federal student aid submitted because most institutions and many private scholarship organizations require the FAFSA for their aid as well. So first I wanna talk just a minute about the free aid, the free money that's available to you and you will be considered for when completing a FAFSA. That will include the federal Pell Grant, the federal supplemental education opportunity grant, the TEACH grant, and the Iraq and Afghanistan service grant. Now, some students will be eligible for one. Some students will be eligible for all of this grant money. The borrowed money will include federal student loans, which are your unsubsidized and subsidized direct loans. The unsubsidized loans are for literally every one that applies. These loans do carry interest while you're in school and then once you go into repayment. With the subsidized federal student loans, and you could be offered both. The interest on the subsidized loan is not going to be accruing while the student is in school. But once you do graduate and go into repayment, you will be required to pay interest on that loan. And just a couple of housekeeping tips that I didn't mention before everyone got into our room. Make sure that you're muted um, so that others aren't distracted by your background noise. And also I want to let you know that you can utilize the chat box within the Zoom platform to ask any questions that you think of as I go through the presentation itself. So we've talked about the federal student loans. If those don't cover the entire cost of your attendance, you will also have the option to borrow a private loan. Now the earned money, Federal work study is a great opportunity for you to work while you're in college and help pay your expenses. Um, and these jobs look great on your first professional resume. So if you accept a federal work study job, which will be offered to you through the financial aid office at your college, and say you're going to a four-year college, say you're working in the financial aid office, that is four years of professional employment that you have to show on that first resume. So please consider answering yes on the FAFSA for your interest in federal work study. Now, all of the federal student aid can be used at private and public four-year colleges, two-year community colleges, career and technical schools for part-time, and online college courses. Now, who can complete a FAFSA? Of course, 
all U.S. citizens and U.S. nationals, those with a green card, with an arrival departure record, have battered immigrant status, or have a T visa. So if you are one of these, what federal student aid considers eligible non-citizens, you can submit your FAFSA. But let's say that you have one of these documents, but your parents do not. That's fine, you can go ahead and submit your FAFSA, but in the parent demographic section, you will enter zeros every place that a parent's social security number is asked for. It really should only take 30 to 45 minutes to submit your FAFSA. If you have all of the documents you need to complete the form with you when you begin. And those documents are going to include the student and parents social security cards because your names and number have to be um, entered in the FAFSA as exactly as they're printed on your card. You'll need your 1040, your federal income tax return for the 2021 tax year. The student, if he completed a tax return and also his parents, if you filed one. You'll need your W-2s from each of your employers from 2021 because there's information on this form that might not be shown on the tax return itself. So it's always a good idea to go ahead and gather this document, these documents as well. And um, you'll be asked to provide your current balances of all your savings and checking accounts. And if you have any cash on hand, you'll be asked for that as well. In addition, I wanna go over quickly the assets that you must provide on the FAFSA and those that you do not have to provide. You must provide the value of any rental property, trust funds, money market, mutual funds, CDs, stocks, options, and bonds. In the parent section of the FAFSA, you will report any five to nine college savings plan balances. And then in the student section of the FAFSA, if you have any UTMA, UGMA accounts, you must report those balances as well. Now, you do not have to report the value of your family home, which was your private, uh, your primary residence, or a family farm, if you have one. Do not report the value of any small businesses with fewer than 100 employees. You do not have to report the value of your life insurance, 401k plans, pension funds, annuities, or any non-education IRAs. And then the last item that's important to begin with is your list of colleges that you plan to apply to. Now, if you haven't applied yet, that's fine. You can go ahead and send these schools your FAFSA data and you can add up to 10 colleges every time you submit your FAFSA. So be working on your list now before the FAFSA opens on October 1st. Now, um, remember that you as the class of 2023, if you're beginning college this upcoming fall, the fall of 2023, oh, here we have someone, you will um, complete the 23 24 FAFSA because that is the year that you're applying for financial aid. Okay, so let's say you're going to be applying to more than 10 colleges. Go ahead and get your first 10 entered, submit a FAFSA, go back once the FAFSA is processed, and you can add an additional 10 and just continue on through this process. So, what good is it going to do? Please make sure that you are. Um, Paying close attention to your college and state and federal deadlines for
for FAFSA submission, every college is going to have a priority financial aid deadline. So when you've got your list of colleges there, go on their sites and make sure that you are submitting your FAFSA before that deadline, because this money is going to be um, awarded on a first come first served basis, and you don't wanna miss those deadlines. For the state, the FAFSA does serve as your TOPS application if you're on the TOPS track, and there is a deadline as well. So make sure that your FAFSA is submitted so you can be in line to receive your TOPS. And then of course, the federal deadline, which you could actually submit all the way through June 30th of 2024, but you could be missing out on some dollars that you might not, uh, that you might miss. You'll want to begin by creating a federal student aid ID. The student and one of his parents needs to create this ID. It's a username and a password that once you get into the system, it will prompt you on the steps that you need to take to create this ID. And then you will use this ID to log into the FAFSA and also to sign your FAFSA. The FAFSA does have to be submitted every academic year that you are going to be applying for financial aid. Oh, I'm gonna ask if everyone can go ahead and make sure that you're muted. Cause I can hear a couple of, um, a little bit of background noise. Thank you. So the FAFSA must be submitted every academic year. Uh, that you're planning to be in college. Uh, it will be used to sign a master promissory note if you borrow for your education. Um, to do your loan counseling, they're not gonna just give you this dollar amount and expect you to know your responsibilities as a borrower. You have to go through loan counseling before you accept your federal student loans. And then once you graduate, if you do have a loan balance, you will use this FSA ID to um, maintain your FAFSA, your uh, federal student aid loan balances. Remember that the FSA ID username and password is your electronic signature and it's legally binding. So make sure that you're keeping it in a very safe place um, so you can use it every year. I always keep my FSA IDs for myself and for my uh, children in my tax folder so that every year when I'm ready to start on the FAFSA, my taxes are there for the next academic year, but you'll find the perfect place to um, save yours. Now, we're ready to begin the FAFSA because you already have your FSA ID. Here is the home page. You can see that there are a lot of resources on uh, this website. So take a look around if you'd like. Remember that your FAFSA, the 2324 FAFSA is not going to be available until October 1st, but you can go ahead and log into the site and um, get some additional information before you begin. You'll be asked to identify your role. Are you the student who is logging in to complete the student section of the FAFSA? Are you the parent who wants to provide your parental information in the student's FAFSA? And then what is a preparer? A preparer is um, someone that you're paying to complete a FAFSA for you, and this is quite rare. You'll see that there are seven sections within the FAFSA itself. Uh, the student demographics, the school selection, dependency status, parent demographics. You'll move to the parent financials, then the student financials, and it's time to sign and submit. The students will be asked for some personal information, which will include their social security number, their personal email address, don't use your school email, and your own mobile phone number. You don't want to share information with others within the form itself because the personal information that's in your FSA ID must match what's in the FAFSA. You'll be asked to provide your permanent mailing address, 
um, list your state of legal <clears throat> residence so that the financial aid offices at your college can determine if they should charge in-state or out-of-state um, fees. And your high school completion status. You'll be asked uh, what degree you're seeking. Are you going to be working on your first bachelor's degree or an associate's degree? This is important for the financial aid office to determine your offer. Your driver's license number to um, verify your state residency. But if you don't have a license, that's fine. This is one of the few questions that you can skip over within the FAFSA. Have you ever been in foster care or are you in foster care now? This information is important because there could be additional financial aid for those who have been in the foster care system. And why are you asked what your parents' education completion level is? Because there could be an additional amount of money available to first generation college graduates from your high school so that your counselors will know that you've completed your FAFSA. And then begin entering the colleges that you're considering. As I mentioned, you can add up to 10 colleges and you will also need to provi provide your housing plans on each campus so that the financial aid office can determine what your cost of attendance is going to be at their school. Now, remember that the FAFSA data is not sent out to every college across the country. You must give federal student aid permission to send your private personal information to the colleges. And I want to go briefly over my dependency yeah. status section. Oh, I don't want something. Mm. So I want to make sure that everybody is muted. Let me go back in and just make sure I can mute someone. All right. In the dependency status section, you are going to be asked a list of questions to consider. That will determine whether you are independent of your parents or dependent upon them. And I know many of you are thinking, well, I'm going to be 18 by the time I begin college. So certainly I'm, a I'm an independent student, but for FAFSA purposes, you'll be asked if you'll be 24 or older by January 1st of the academic year that you're applying for aid. So you can see that the 18 year old um, cutoff is going to be increased to 24 years of age. Anyone beneath 24 will have to provide parental information. Or you'll be asked, consider, are you married or separated but not divorced? This is you as the student. Are you working toward a master's or doctorate degree? You have children who receive more than half of their support from you, the student. Are you currently serving on active duty in the US Armed Forces? Are you a veteran of the US Armed Forces? Are both of your parents deceased? Are you an emancipated minor or are you in legal guardianship as determined by a court in your state of residence? Now, you're going to find as you move throughout the FAFSA that there are some legal and financial aid terms that you might not be familiar with, but don't fret because beside every question uh, you're asked will be a question mark and you can always check on the question mark for a more detailed description or a definition. I want to make sure that um, those that are in this situation understand that there is a difference between legal guardianship and legal custody. Legal guardianship means that your legal parent has relinquished their legal responsibility for you. So make sure if you think you're in legal guardianship, look at your um, legal documents to make sure. And then the last question you'll be asked to consider is, are you an unaccompanied youth who is homeless 
or are you at risk of being homeless? Now, if you can answer yes to just one of these questions, then you're considered an independent student. Remember that you'll have to show your legal documentation to the college financial aid office, but you can skip over the parental section of the FAFSA because you're considered independent. Now, what if you do not live with your legal parents and you can't answer one of these questions, the prior 10 questions? Say you live with grandparents or other relatives or perhaps neighbors, but they do not have um, legal guardianship of you. They have not adopted you. Those parties should never provide information about themselves on your FAFSA. Even if you're living in their household, you still must provide information about your legal parents. Now, you've completed the student section, the dependency status section, and the school selection section. You're moving on to the parent demographics. We're going to uh, consider that everybody in our group here is a dependent student, and I want to go quickly over the parent section of the FAFSA. But first, we need to determine which parent or parents that you need to provide information about. Now, if you live with both of your legal parents, your biological parents, then that's easy. You'll have uh, to provide information about both of them, whether they're married or they've never been married or they're separated or divorced. If they live together in the household with you, you must provide information about both of them. But let's say that the parent that you lived with the longest in the past 12 months is either separated, divorced, or was never married. Then you provide information about that legal parent only. Unless that parent is now remarried, and then you must provide information about the step parent. Because federal student aid wants to get an idea of the financial standing of the household that the student has lived in the longest in the past 12 months. If you're moving through this form and you have questions, um, you can always call Federal Student Aid directly or you can call me on Leela's FAFSA helpline and I'm happy to, to um, help you work, th work through that uh, question. I'm gonna be providing my information um, to you toward the end of the presentation. So you've made it through the identification of your parent or parents. They want to know information about them, their social security numbers, dates of birth, their contact information, um, whether they're married or they're divorced or separated. And then, as I mentioned, you'll begin to, inform to enter information about each of them. Now make sure when you are in this section and you're providing an email address in that field that you use the email address of the parent who created that federal student aid ID. If mom created the federal student aid ID and used her personal um, email address, but you put dad's email address within the FAFSA form itself, you're not gonna be able to sign the form. So make sure you remember that as you're creating your IDs. You'll be asked if there are any other dependents in the family household. So if there are younger siblings, you can um, receive credit for the size of your household. If you have a children who are in college, um, they are still pretty much dependent upon you. And unless they can answer one of those prior dependency status questions, um, then they are a dependent student. So include those children as well. Parents will then be asked what their tax filing status is. Did you file a tax return in 2021? And if you did, you're encouraged to use the Internal Revenue Services Data Retrieval Tool. Number one, it's a lot simpler. 
It's going to save time. It's going to reduce errors. And it's going to reduce the student's chances of being selected for verification on his college campus. You do not have to use this tool, but if you choose not to, be prepared for the colleges that you listed on your FAFSA to ask you to go to the IRS site and um, request a tax transcript from them so they can verify that the information you manually entered in the tax section is exactly what the IRS has on file. And you will probably be a little bit thrown off, which a lot of parents are. You've already entered either manually or through the tool your income from 2021, but they want to know which parent made um, which dollar amounts. So this is where you're going to grab those W-2s. If you have two parents reporting um, within your family on the FAFSA, you will need each of the W-2s from those parents. You'll be asked what parent one made and how much of that income parent two made as well. You've completed the parent section, the demographics and the financials. Now you're moving on to the student tax filing status. If the students did file a tax return in 2021, they'll be asked the exact same questions. The student can also use the IRS data retrieval tool if he chooses to. Now, don't be caught off guard because these financial sections are back to back. And many times a student will contact us and say, my expected family contribution looks too high. Occasionally parents will enter their financials and then they begin to see the same questions again without looking up toward the top to see that this is now the student financial section. So be very mindful of that when you're entering your financials. You're almost finished with FAFSA itself, but I'm going to encourage you to take a very close look at your FAFSA summary. The summary is a list of every question that you're asked within the FAFSA and your answer to each. So review this section. If you find that you need to make a correction, you can do so here within the summary. Just click on the hyperlink to that question that you want to change. It will take you back to that section and you can make that correction because you want to make sure that the financial aid office has the most um, accurate data so that they can quickly um, prepare your financial aid offer. Then it's almost time to sign and submit the form itself. You'll be asked to verify that the information you're providing within the FAFSA is accurate to the best of your knowledge. And then you will be asked to use your FSA IDs to sign the FAFSA. The student will use his username and password to electronically sign and one parent as well. Once you've electronically signed and submitted your FAFSA, you will receive a FAFSA confirmation page. It'll pop up on your screen and I'm going to encourage you to either take a screenshot or print this page. There's important information on your responsibilities and what you need to do once your FAFSA is submitted. You're going to receive an email version of this page, but this is everything in one compact um, statement, and it's best to go ahead and keep a copy of it. It does take three to five days to process your FAFSA, and at that time, your data is going to be sent on to your college financial aid offices. Now, you'll want to make sure that if you have not completed your college admissions applications, that you do that, because most times your FAFSA data is going to be sitting there in the financial aid offices computer queue. And once you've applied for admissions and been accepted, they'll pull down um, your financial aid information and begin to work on your offer. 
you'll be shown your accepted family contribution. And this is not a dollar amount. I know that looks high, but this is a formula that federal student aid is sending over to your colleges so that they know how much aid that you will be um, eligible for on their campus. You'll see your eligibility information. You'll begin to see some dollar amounts perhaps for grants or student loans. But remember that this is just an estimate. Federal student aid is not going to make a financial aid offer to you. That is the responsibility of each financial aid office. And then you'll see a list of the colleges that you listed on your FAFSA so that you can always go back and see who's already received it and who you need to send it to. Once the financial aid office receives your information and they're ready to begin working on your financial aid offer, their purpose is to determine the student's net price. They're gonna take the cost of attendance on their campus Try to identify any grants and scholarships that you might be eligible to receive, anything that they can offer you, and the remaining amount is going to be your and your family's responsibility to pay, and that's call, called your net price. When you select the college that you're going to, you always want to accept that financial aid offer in this order, the free money, grants and scholarships, the earned money, work study. Remember, those don't have to be repaid. And then your last option would be loans. And most often students who need to meet that net price, but they don't quite have enough money to do so to complete that academic year will accept a student loan to pay that difference. I want to encourage you, I know that many of you have already begun your scholarship search. The bottom line is the more scholarships and free money that you earn your senior year, the lower your student loan balances are going to be. So make sure you're checking with your college counselor, with the financial aid offices at the college, the admissions offices, they see a lot of dollars coming through for different students. They know about institutional scholarships as well. You could check with religious um, organizations, perhaps your parents have um, employers that match some funds and they may have some opportunities for you. Um, local businesses are a great place to begin and then begin your national scholarship searches. If you find you have some met financial need um, and you do need to cover that net price, Leela does administer a nonprofit education loan program. It's just for Louisiana residents. So make sure that you're checking that out at leelachoice.org if you need us. And also, if you haven't already received a copy of your FAFSA, of Leela's FAFSA completion guide for the class of 2023, I would be happy to send one over to you. It's an electronic copy at this time. Um, so please let me know if you need a copy of it. It goes into a little greater detail of what uh, the process is, and it's um, great to look back to refer to. Another free resource is Leela's Parent guide to planning and paying for college. If you're interested in this, I'm happy to send it over to you via email. In addition to our senior checklist for college planning to kind of keep you on track on a month by month basis. So you're ready to begin college in the fall. Lila has two scholarship opportunities. There is a $1,000 FAFSA completion scholarship. So add this to your list of things to do once you submit your FAFSA. You can use the QR code or you can grab the application on our website at leela.org. For those of you who plan to stay in Louisiana and attend a college here in the state, 
we welcome that. And we do have another scholarship opportunity worth $1,000 as well. If you feel like you want um, some one-on-one -on -one assistance, this is a virtual opportunity uh, via Zoom. We'll Zoom together and I'll be live with you online as you complete your FAFSA step-by-step. -step. You can schedule a completion session by using this QR code and I'm happy to get that scheduled. Of course, it'll be October 1st or after, but it's okay to go ahead and request your session now. If you decide to jump on into the FAFSA, go ahead, please feel free. Um, but if you're having trouble along the way and you just have a quick question, you're always welcome to contact our FAFSA helpline. It's there for you. It's for all Louisiana residents. So keep a note of it. In addition to my email address, if you wanna correspond with me directly. I hope that I've answered all of your questions. If not, I've answered most of them. So I'm going to check the um, Zoom chat box to see if anyone has a specific question. And while I'm looking back over those uh, requests for information, please feel free to go ahead and drop any um, question that you might have into the chat box. All right, so this uh, parent is asking about the tax information. So you will be um, asked for um, information from your 2021 income tax return. So that may, means any money that you earn during 2021 will be included in the 2021. 324 FAFSA. You're not looking at the 2020 income. You've completed 2021's earnings, you filed that return in 2022, and you'll use it to complete the 2324 FAFSA. That's a lot of 20s, but um, you can always feel free to look back over the presentation. I'm happy to send it over to you if you want to keep a record of it. Yes, the, um, the slides themselves, because the, tw the 2324 FAFSA has not been um, dropped, has not dropped yet, those slides do show within the screenshot itself the 2020 tax year. That is because we don't have slides for 2021 yet because we haven't seen that FAFSA, but you do need to include information about your 2021 taxes. I will be providing a recording of this session to your counselor, so be on the lookout for that. Or if you would like to receive a copy directly from me, email me and I'll be happy to send it over. And that's right. These slides are not reflecting the 2324 FAFSA yet because we haven't seen them, but we do know that um, information from the 2021 income tax return will be asked for in the 2324 FAFSA. I see several requests for the slides themselves. And yes, that is my email address. I'll type it in the chat box, but it is there on the screen as well. Now, do I have anyone in our group that has already submitted a FAFSA? So remember that that federal student aid ID that you created either for yourself, if you were a student, or for your older child is still valid. That is your legal electronic signature for all federal student aid um, business, and you will use it for yourself, you will use it for your 
uh, any students you've had that have already graduated and are still in college and mama or dad, you will use your FSA ID, the same ID to sign um, your seniors FAFSA as well. So you don't have to create another ID. Does anyone else have specific questions? Does that, is everybody clear pretty much on the dependency status section? We always have a lot of questions about that or which parents information to provide on the FAFSA. That's another big one. But ne always know that you have a lot of support. You have your counselors at school, you have federal student aid, you can um, call them directly, or you can call Leela's FAFSA helpline and we're all here to help you. All right, I don't see any other questions, so I'm going to encourage you to contact me directly if you need me. And again, I want to thank you for having me this evening, and I want to make sure that um, you have the support that you need. Know that we are here to help you if you have other questions. I hope everybody has a good night and a great senior year. <laughs>